Symbols are what elevate us above animals. And I think that in Satan's bag of tricks, just the manipulation of symbols alone is a tool that's capable of controlling mankind. This is a very interesting use of symbols. A friend of mine who worked for the New World Order, very high up in the New World Order, and he was one of their mind-controlled slaves. He had been part of the Illuminati. And one day, his photographic memory wrote down this formula. He said that the Tetragrammaton, which is the symbol that stands for God, equaled a formula for DNA. And I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I thought this was a very interesting use of symbols. My friend was to visit me on January 12th. On January 11th, he was murdered. So when we begin to look for God, where do we start? Well, if we decide that there's no God, we have placed ourselves in the position known as atheism or the same position that some Buddhists have placed themselves in. But if we decide that there are gods or a god, then we have another choice to make. Are there many gods or one god? If we decide that there are many gods, then th we have decided uh, to take the position known as polytheism, which is the same as Mormonism, the New Age movement, Greek and Roman mythology, Hinduism. But if we decide that there is one god, then we come down here and we can decide whether he is identified with the universe or whether he is distinct from the universe. If we say that he is identified with the universe, we have taken the position known as pantheism and panentheism, which is uh, Zen Buddhism and Christian science. But if we say that he is distinct from the universe, then we have a choice. Is he finite or infinite? If he is finite, then we have placed ourselves in the position that the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses took. There is a little known doctrine that they promulgated the first half of their history, and most Jehovah's Witnesses are not aware of it, but the leadership that they have today, which is old, was around when they promulgated this doctrine, and they haven't repudiated it, so we have to assume that they still hold to it. And that doctrine was that God was a finite being, like you or I, and he lived in the star constellation, the Pleiades. You've heard of Pleiadians. And he, this was specifically on the star Alcyon, and he sent messages to the governing body of the Watchtower Society from Alcyon, and it took eight days. But if we say that God is infinite, then we come down here and ma can make the choice <coughs> that he never does miracles, or he sometimes does miracles. If he never does miracles, that's what's known as deism. The rational thinkers of the 1700s thought that way, like Thomas Jefferson. However, a lot of those men were closet occultists. But then we can also decide that he sometimes does miracles, and this is places us into this uh, category known as theism, which is uh, typified by the faith of Abraham and many of the types of your mainstream monotheistic religions. So, how do we know what's truth? If we go back to the beginning, we will find out that there were two sources of truth. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil includes worldly knowledge of what is right and wrong. It's the letter of the law of God. And the dead religion based on compliance to the dead letter of the law. It's man-made compliance to law and man-made changes in outward behavior. It's a focus on self. If we focus on ourself, we can go two directions. We can indulge and become licentious or we can go the other route, which is a problem in some churches. We can become self-righteous. 
It also includes a false trust that worldly philosophy and other fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will expose Satan. It will not expose Satan. Why? Because Satan appears as an angel of light. Remember how much we have placed in the basket as it was passed around? Satan was willing to give Christ the entire world on the mountaintop. How's that for a donation? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will not expose Satan. This is what is called in Scripture the flesh. It leads to death, not to mention also producing in the mind lasciviousness, double-mindedness, and pride in what one knows. It's the goodness of man, and it's very popular. But the other tree in the garden, it included a fear of God, peace, God-centered knowledge, which is relevant to what God is doing, therefore wisdom. It's the spirit of the law, a living faith in a relationship with Yahweh God. And spirit made changes in the heart. It focuses on Christ, the spirit, and the heavenly father. It exposes Satan and his influences by correctly using the living word of God written by the spirit along with the guidance of the spirit. It's what the scriptures call the spirit. It leads to life, not to mention a renewed sound mind and humility to learn from others and from the master teacher. It's the goodness of God. And it's very unpopular because a natural man doesn't receive the things of God because they're foolishness to him. But there was a problem. Satan came into the garden and brought evil. And this has produced a logic problem. For here we have a God who's omniscient, all-knowing, and a God that's omnipotent, almighty, and yet he's, we're told that he's holy good, and yet something that this holy good, all-knowing, uh, all-powerful God, something that he has created, has evil in it. Now this problem has faced all of us on a subconscious or a conscious level. In fact, it was such a problem with philosophers in the 1940s that a number of them began, it, began writing books and phil uh, philosophical systems. They were writing books to expose Christianity and other religions as being illogical, especially because of this logic problem. One of these men uh, lived in Boston, and uh, he worked for decades writing a book exposing the illogic of uh, Christianity because of this logic problem. In the early 1960s, he realized that his philosophical system had the same logic problem. In fact, even though he didn't become a Christian, he realized that the Bible had a lot to tell us. And so he spent the next decade writing a book explaining how much Christianity did have to offer. But a lot of us, we go to our clergymen and we ask them about this problem of evil and we're given insufficient answers. We're told, just have faith. Or we're told, there's no contradiction. Or you know, the answer is so smooth, but by the time they're finished, all these terms are devoid of their usual meanings and are vague. Or perhaps it's declared to us that we only see through a glass darkly. These insufficient answers leave many reasonable persons deeply disturbed by the absurdity of conventional belief in God. Some have decided that human life is self-defeating, tragic, and absurd. There's better answers. But you may be wondering, why is Fritz focusing on this? When time is so short in this talk, and we all know that there's a problem with evil, and we all deal with